Hi, this is Pastor Joe Johnson, and welcome to His Kingdom Now. And I'm really glad that you're joining us this week as we open up the Word of God and we study principles concerning His kingdom that will allow us to see the will of God and His kingdom come on the earth as surely as these things are done in heaven. You know, we live in some very crazy times right now, and yet Jesus personally guaranteed that when we hear His sayings and we do them, we are assured to come out on top every single time. So again, I'm glad that you're joining us. God bless and enjoy the service. Very good. Well, let's pray. And uh, I'm expecting maximum return uh, from today's service. And uh, we're not going to, any of us in this room are going to be able to have that without uh, working with God himself. So Heavenly Father, let's pray. Uh, we are so grateful that you injected into time and space the Word of God. You've chosen uh, most of the time men uh, to speak directly through and to and based on experiences and based on revelation, you have injected into our world how you think, what you expect, how we're supposed to act, and what it is that causes us, as I prayed earlier at the beginning of the service, to have a relationship with you, our Heavenly Father, first and foremost, primarily out of a position or a place of love, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I need the Holy Spirit more than even the air that I breathe right now. And uh, I'm excited. Uh, you've got me pumped all week about what we're going to talk about. But that's great. But nothing's going to get done without your assistance. And that means I need to pray for uh, everyone here that's in this room, everyone that's going to be watching uh, this service via TV and our YouTube channel, that the Holy Spirit would just minister so awesomely, marvelously, life-changingly, and, uh, and by the time every one of us are done, whether it's here now in the room or watching, by the time we're done, our heads will be so full with gratitude, appreciation, but also great sobriety on what you've provided us through your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, what we want to do is uh, we're actually continuing uh, our service on the end times, the signs of the times. And uh, we'll review briefly, actually getting ready for today's service. I cut out, normally, you know, I like to really take a lot of time reviewing the previous service, but uh, we're going to make this one a, a quick one going through to get us into the subject matter that we wanted to talk about. But uh, what we're doing is, is we're discussing the subject of what the end times are going to look like. And so today, in getting you and really what we want to talk about, I'm just titling today, Truth. Just Truth. And a couple things we need to consider, first of all, uh, about truth. Contrary, and this, there's nothing new under the sun, but contrary to uh, relativism, which says, well, you know, truth is dependent on multiple things. Listen, if I jump off of the Empire State Building, the truth of gravity isn't up for an option. There's nothing you're going to do about it. In about a minute and a half, I'm going to hit the cement. Truth, by definition, is exclusionary to anything else. And it's really ridiculous. I mean, think about it. When someone says this, well, I don't believe there, there is no ultimate truth. Well, guess what? You just violated your own principle by making a contrary statement saying there is no ultimate truth. You just stated what you believe is the truth. So let's be careful. Listen, a lot of people, and I know there's folks today that'll go, well, you know, well, what about, what about, and they, they almost like they take on this air of sophistication by having lots of questions. Well, last time I checked, someone who has lots of questions doesn't know a lot. See, having lots of questions is showing your ignorance, not your brilliance. And it's important for us to know, listen, especially if we're talking about, like, God, you would think that He is big enough 
and has the ability to communicate to his creation to such a degree that, and uh, that was last week we used, uh, actually it was in uh, doing simple church, to make it so that even a caveman can understand it. Listen, Jesus rejoiced at one point the most brilliant scholars on the planet were missing every, almost everything that Jesus was saying. Jesus lifted up his hands and looked up into heaven and says, Father, I'm rejoicing that you're revealing these things to babes. In other words, the Lord just really enjoys showing his amazing brilliance and wisdom and power and making it so that even kids can get a grasp of it. And so that's what we're going to do today, go through some signs of the times. If you remember from last week, the first one we'll just talk about here in a second is deception. And if we are warned about deception, uh, I don't think it's really fair if God would warn us you can be deceived without giving us the truth so we're not deceived. So let's uh, do a little bit of review. And this is where we started last week. Matthew 24, 3, and as he, speaking of Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age, and Jesus answered. For the sake of time, this is one of the things I took out, but we really spent a lot of time last week talking about definitions. Listen, one of the things that, it's easily solved when you take the time, but we all know it doesn't take a rocket science to understand that one language can have different meanings and inflections and emphasis than another language has, and you just got to take the time to make sure you're not missing anything. Well, what we wanted to do is, is last week we talked about the definitions in the Greek of these specific words. Uh, when Jesus came to him privately, the disciples, I'm sorry, when the disciples came to Jesus, they, this was like, these, and this is important that you understand who was with him. This wasn't the general crowd to where he's just watering everything down, just trying to get things by. I mean, these are his closest associates. These are his closest associates. They've been with him. As a matter of fact, if you remember, after Judas died, you know, he betrayed the Lord and ended up killing himself. The qualification to choose the, to replace him was someone that had been following and been with them since the time of the baptism of John the Baptist. I mean, these guys have been with him a long time. They'd seen the miracles. They'd listened to what he taught. Now, this is huge because, you know, what we're going to go into in a second. So they asked him, tell us when and what will be the, end, the sign of your coming in the end of the age. And in the Greek, those words, it's not like just a general kind of, well, what's it going to, you know, it, what season is it going to be like? Is it going to start getting warm? Is it going to, those are words that were very specific, which means we want time, date, place, colors. These words in the Greek were very specific. They didn't want any ambiguity at all. And I like what he says, and Jesus answered. I've shared with you many times, listen, I've learned with the Lord that even if I don't get something right away, just give him some time, he'll get it across to you. Just give him some time, and uh, he'll, he'll, he'll answer you. But notice, and just as a, I'll put this in a plug-in for as far as him and our father and our relationship, notice that those closest to him were able to ask a question those in the crowd outside couldn't or didn't. There, is a, there are positions in God. The closer you get to him, he's, like, he's, he's very clear. He works in relationships like, just like anybody else. Listen, I have four children. At any given time, any one of them can be closer to me than the others. And it's during that time when we're close together and talking about things, they're privy. I could be in the car with one. Well, guess what? That one in the car is privy to a conversation. The others aren't. And so I want to encourage you. Listen, there's places in God while you're here on this earth, that we can continually get so close and so intimate with him that we can ask anything. And by the time he's through, you'd understand and get to know the answer. And I just, the first thing I do when I go, why can't I just figure this thing out? The first thing, really, or one of the first things, I want to be careful, I don't want to uh, not tell the truth here. One of the, but one of the first things I'll consider is, how's my walk with God? Like if I'm stumbling and I can't figure anything out, I'll ask, how close am I to him? How am I doing? Because I know that he wants to talk to me. He wants to answer. So he's ready to answer these guys. Now check and see what he said. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. Who's he talking to? Oh, well, I just took two minutes to, 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 in minute detail, talk about this crowd. Why? Because whatever deception he's talking about 
even those closest to him had a potential of falling for it. He's speaking to those, they have been following him, they've been working with him almost three and a half years from the time of John the Baptist. And they asked him this question, and the very first answer he gives as far as, okay, I'm going to start letting you know what the signs of the times. As we're getting ready to wrap up, this is the first thing I want to address with you close friends. Even you need to pay attention, lest you be deceived. So there must be something about this deception that can sneak up on even those closest to the Lord. Wow, I'm not so sure about that. Listen, if deception can close in on Lucifer and Judas, I'd say they were pretty close to the Lord. They didn't catch up on anybody. And we talked about last week in one of the definitions, take heed is from the Greek word blepo, which means look out. Pay attention. Pay real close attention. Be always on guard. Be vigilant. And so we we need to be aware that deception, this ability to not get things right is so insidious and can catch any one of us that Jesus gets, and and we said this uh, last week, remember, Jesus, Paul, and all the other scriptures we're going to quote, they don't give us information to scare us, but to inform us and prepare us and arm us. We're not going to get there today, uh, because of, I want to stick with the one subject, but when Jesus eventually, and we'll, and we'll get back into it next week, when he starts talking about some of the nasty things that can happen, wars, rumors of wars, even Christians being persecuted, literally in the Greek, in English we read, do not be afraid, uh, in the Greek language, there's a literal prohibition for the Christian to be afraid. Like when you watch all the things that are happening on the planet today, you are not, if you're a a child of of God, you're not allowed to be afraid. He doesn't even give you permission to be afraid. And he was very clear as all these things. And so even when we're talking about this, don't be afraid. Just do what what he's going to tell us to do so that we don't have this deception going on. The word deception is the Greek word planao. Which was very, it was a very established word in the New Testament and first century uh, usage. In other words, this was one of those words like you're not going to, you know exactly what it means. History, secular writings, this is how that word deception. When Jesus said, take heed, watch out, always be careful so you don't have this. And we're going to see, we're going to get an indication of why it could be so easy to happen to anyone. This word means moral deception and confusion. It isn't a matter of just blatant sinning. It's talking about being confused about what's right and wrong. People who have veered from a solid path and are dangerously close to peril. Moral wanderers. Well, I'll try out this religion for five seconds, for for five years. I think I'm going to try, I'm going to coexist and try them all. Moral wandering. Departing from common sense. Now, before, I'm, before I get going, I need you to understand something about some things that we're going to say. And some of you might think, Pastor Joe, are you telling me? No. No, I didn't write this. There's absolutely nothing that we're going to read that I had anything to do with it. My job is to get you today to go and ask By what authority can the Bible say that? Well, by the time we're done, you're going to know exactly by what authority. But I'm going to say some things. Because if there's ever a generation, now all generations have have gotten kind of loopy. But especially with technology, there has never, I'll submit, there's never been a time where such moral confusion is broadcasted 24-7. Did you know this? That right now, I forget, I think, the, I think it's 70 to 80% of the planet right now, 70 to 80% of the planet has a cell phone. Information, it can be accessed almost entirely through the entire world. There's never been a time where if some crazy idea shows up, it can instantly be in your face. 
and talked about and through internet have discussions worldwide about it. That's actually what we're going to find out later. That's one of the signs of the end times about the gospel being preached throughout the world. He wasn't saying the gospel would be preached in every single hut. When we start talking about, we'll go into the Greek word world. It had nothing to do with every individual house. That's we actually qualify for that verse now. Yes. And that's the final sign he said he was going to give. Okay? So, departing from common sense. It's important that as I'm going through today, and if you're watching, it's important that you listen to the entire service because statements are going to be made not because of what I think, because of what it says. My job, once again, is to get you go, does it have a right to say that? Okay? Departing from common sense. This word is specific to moral wandering, wandering from right to wrong. Now, listen, the scriptures will let you believe whatever you want. My job is not to tell you what to believe. It's to say, this is what it says, and then you just deal with it between you and God. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion or planao so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We're going to come back to that. We're going to come back and we're going to find one of the biggest fruits that are produced through deception is ultimate permission to live however you want. Now the Spirit expressly says, we talked about this last week, in the Greek it literally means explicitly, undeniably, in no uncertain terms, there's no room for doubt or understanding. So the Spirit <coughs> says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. We're going to come back to that term, the faith. Listen, there's a qualifier in the Greek. In other words, he's not talking about some will depart from believing God to get healed. Some are going to depart from believing God for whatever. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is some will depart from the faith, the definitions, the doctrines, the parameters of what it is to walk with God. It does not say that they are rejecting God. They're just going to depart from what he says it takes to live with him correctly. There is the faith. And there's only one place we get the faith from, and that's the Scriptures. Amen. My job, one more time, probably won't be the last time I'm going to say it, is to present evidence on whether the Scriptures have the right to say what they're about to say. Do the Scriptures have the right to get in your face, in your professor's face, into the newsman's face, and go... You might be sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. And on top of that, you have no right to talk about things you have no idea about. I asked last week, has there ever been a time when there is so much confusion and aimless wandering from even the most concrete evidences to such extremes that now there is confusion over what is a man or a woman? Now, whether you believe that or not, that's none of my business in the sense that you got your own decisions you're going to make before God. But the word dysphoria is confusion. It perfectly fits the description. I'm not, you can say you're you can believe you're right or you're wrong. We're building the case. This is what the scriptures say. My job again, I said I'd repeat it. Can they, do they have the right to say that? And if they have the right to say that, that means there's some introspection that needs to be going on with all of us. Okay, this is where we get into it. Time to go down the rabbit hole. And this is where uh, I'm not going to be in a hurry, but I am convinced you're going to be given so much information today that I, because I don't want to screw it up, we are going to close the service with the testimony of, of one of the, at the time, one of the world's most prolific atheists and what brought him to his knees, kicking and screaming to come to know God and became the great, one of the greatest apologists Christianity ever had. 
I'm believing that the weight, did you know glory, the presence of God has a weight? There's an exceeding weight of glory. I'm believing that the pressure from the weight, and I'm only going to have one service to do it. It's not like this is a whole college course. But I'm believing that it's kind of like when you're working out, and you knock off some bench presses, put a couple more plates on. Okay, two more plates. What I want to do today is just keep adding plates. Keep adding plates. Keep adding plates. So that those of you who are believing God, oh my gosh, you're going to walk out of here jumping, shouting, praising God that you're standing on firm ground. If you're being, if you're being inundated and there's people in your face telling you that it's stupid to believe in God, you can't, there's many gods, there's many religions, I'm going to give you some things to think about. Evidences, not philosophy. Well, Pastor, can you prove God? I absolutely am going to prove his existence today. Just maybe not in the way you think. Let's watch this. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you. Oh, look what we see again. To contend for the faith. That was once for all delivered to the saints. Why is he doing this? For certain people have crept in unnoticed. What Jesus said was going to happen is now happening. Years later, he's already rose again. He's done his, his resurrection salvation thing. He's at the right hand of God. Now, what Jesus said was going to happen is now taking place. And I want us to see some things. Let's look at some definitions. Because the first, I want you to notice who this is addressed to. Depending on the, uh, on the translation, beloved, brethren, in other words, what he's about to say is not to ministers, but to Christians. What he's about to, and I'm going to get with some definitions, you're going to see how strong what he is saying is. In other words, if you're in this room, you are being told to do this, not just the preacher. My job is to give you the, the equipment you need to be able to do this. Because this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I'll tell you what, one of the surest ways to stop from being afraid is to know the truth and know what's going on. Did you know, I, I, you know, when I've flown with people on an airlines and you'll watch and you'll start hitting bumps, man, and passengers, they'll start getting scared and nervous and I'm just sitting there just... And a couple times I've talked to people, well, how can you be so short? Because I fly jets and I can tell you because I have knowledge, that, pff, there's nothing to worry about. See, I think one of the most tragic things in this planet, uh, in, this, in our generation, in any generation, but what's tragic is the opinions people have about God and they haven't even studied to know whether it's true or not. More theology is discussed over tequila shots than spending time on their knees and in the books to find out what's true. I'm telling you, if you're getting your ideas about God by chasing beers and you're partying, friends, you're, in the, you're, you're not learning from anybody and you're going to walk out of there just as confused as the person you're bouncing quarters is with. So, let's look at some definitions. Jude says, first of all, he says, I found it necessary. The word necessary literally means pressure. And distress. So in other words, he says, I'm finding it necessary based on these people coming in. There is intense pressure on the inside of me to write to you what I'm writing to you. He says this, and I'm appealing when he says this, when he's asking them what to do, it literally means to implore, urge, to even beg them to do this. That's how serious this situation is, and I submit to you, it, if it could be more serious, it is today, because they didn't have the access to error back then like we have today. And then he says, contend. See, it's contend isn't just like, okay, I'm going to do my best and maybe argue over coffee. It literally means to fight and struggle intensely. So let's go ahead and let's translate that verse using this. Beloved, what he's saying is, although I really wanted to discuss our salvation that belongs to all of us, the pressure within me is so overwhelming that if I must, I will even beg you to viciously fight for and defend with all your strength the faith 
that is granted to every one of us until the Lord comes back. You should. I want you to, this is to all, all of us. There is pressure so overwhelming that if I have to, I'm begging you. Dennis, if I have to, I'm going to beg you to fight viciously for the faith delivered once and for all. I may go into this, and I'm going to use as, actually I can bring that up now. As of the time of this service, and we'll just talk about the facts. Doesn't matter what my opinion is, doesn't matter what your opinion is, at the time of this service, there is some very intense things going on in our country, specifically over the nomination of a Supreme Court justice. Okay? Now, and here's what we're, again, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. And this is where we're going to start going. Who can tell me what is the number one contention over whether this individual is telling the truth or not? What's the number one contention that right now, again, I'm not, I'm not, this is not about politics because I'm setting up where we're going to go. What's the number one when someone says, you just can't, you got to let them in. What's the number one contention? There's no eyewitnesses. No one can corroborate the individual's story. Let me ask you this. How long would we be having this, this, these discussions if one person showed up and said, yep, I saw it happen. I was there. What do you think our entire nation would be doing? Kavanaugh would be in jail. On one witness. Do you think maybe I'm building this and getting us ready for some things? But I'm, before we keep going, the reason why I brought that up now, how many of you all saw that uh, video of Senator Flake and those women that started yelling at him about how they've been sexually abused? And one of them actually said this, you look at me when I talk to you. Oh, by the way, did you know she works for a, Democrat, a radical progressive George Soros funded organization. This is what I want to know. I want to know what Senator Flake is doing looking like a beat puppy dog while some woman gets in his face, pointing uh -huh. in his face and telling him, don't you, you look at me. I'll tell you what should have happened. He says, sweetheart, I'll talk to you all you want, but you talk to me like that again, I'm shutting this door right now. You will not talk. If I'm not going to talk to you that way, listen, the dialogue in our nation and especially when it comes to the things of God has gotten so gross. Listen, if I have pressure within me to viciously fight for my faith, you are not going to pressure me and get me uncomfortable about what I believe. And saints, you need to be in the same position. Amen. And the man looked like a beat puppy dog. Why am I bringing him in? Not politics, because I watch Christians bend regularly. Because they think their professor, they think their teacher, they think their friends have got something on them. No, they don't. They got nothing on you. You just don't know right now. Yes. But that's going to change in the next few minutes. <laughs> Teenager, you have, you have the opportunity of a lifetime. You, this, there's a saying, the strength of youth is wasted on the youth. Oh my gosh, your strength, your zeal. I'll tell you what, let's focus it. Let's find out that you don't have to bend like a beaten puppy in front of your biology teacher, in front of your philosophy pre uh, professor. Your back can be strong and you can actually even welcome the fight. Because you want to beat them? No, because you want to serve them. Because the only reason they believe what they believe is they don't know what they're talking about. And you want to help them. But the last thing you're going to do is help somebody by looking like that sinner did, like a beaten puppy. Okay? Evidence. So now the rest of what we're, going to, what we're talking about is by what authority... Do the scriptures, does the man or woman of God, by what authority, when you're in school, when you're at work, by what authority, what reasons, 
What facts do you have that gives you the right to say, no, the scriptures are inerrant. We did not evolve from monkeys. God made us. I'm not going to argue with you what a day is, but I can tell you what, my grandfather is not an orangutan. Evidence. Let's talk. First of all, eyewitness testimony. What did we just talk about? The argument go. Judge Kavanaugh is in jail right now because remember, there's no statute of limitations on sexual assault. There is something to be said, drunk high schoolers, and now 40 years later. But if one person if just one person comes up and says, I saw it, he did it, I guarantee you things are a whole lot different in our nation. So eyewitness testimony is huge. And I'm submitting to you just one would end a man's life. First mm-hmm. Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. For I delivered to you, this is the Apostle Paul, as of first importance... What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Notice the word of God was the authority he based the experience on. We're going to talk about that in a little while too. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Before we keep going, remember the series? Listen, Christianity starts with a risen Messiah. It doesn't start with a philosophy. It doesn't start with a moral code. Did Jesus, he died on the cross, but did he really get up? Can we prove that what he said happened? In other words, then, will this prove that God's word is accurate, that there's true? Can this prove that there's God? Listen, no one. You can say, well, can can you prove there's God? Well, absolutely, in the same way, Someone could prove that Kavanaugh did that to her if they had eyewitness corroborated testimony. And there isn't a court in the land that will not say, nope, they proved it. Thousands of decisions in courtrooms are made every day because things are proved based on evidence. See, when people do that, they're waiting for some angel to come out of the sky. They're waiting for some deep philosophical thought or idea and volumes of libraries. No, you start by proving something. Is there anybody that saw and can corroborate with the facts? This is what happened. That he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter... Then he appeared to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500, more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. In other words, if you don't believe me, this is Paul writing, you go talk to any of them. They're still alive. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Let's look at some facts about this. I want you to consider this. Let's just take those 500 witnesses. Listen, if you interview just the 500 witnesses and no one else for only six minutes, including cross-examination, you would have 50 hours of first-hand eyewitness testimony. I want you to think about sitting and going, well, you can't really prove God. We just don't know if it happened. Just those people. And they said, if you don't believe me, go get them. Imagine in the courtroom sitting and listening. And you're limited them just to six minutes. Over 50 hours of listening to people. I witness, corroborate, Jesus is alive. Our nation right now is looking for one person to corroborate. What did John have to say? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, and we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Peter, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. And you'll hear that. People in school, wow, well, you know, these are just made up fables. It's oral tradition just passed on. That is a lie. 
We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Oh, and you wait, here comes the trump card. Jesus, and so Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own, but only what he sees the father doing. Even Jesus appeals to eyewitness testimony. Even the master didn't simply appeal to philosophy and wisdom. He said, I see him. The beginning of the gospel, John says, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the heart of the Father, he has explained him. The only person that could possibly fully explain God is someone who's eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth with him. Eyewitness accounts Jesus brought to the earth. All right, verifiability, verified. All right, great, eyewitness accounts. How do we look at things like reliability? Who says what should be recognized as scripture? Oh, I know, because don't you know, of course, over your tequila shots or your professor of philosophy that doesn't know squat about the scriptures, the Bible is full of contradictions. You can't really trust it. Oh, You'll see the higher critics now. Well, we don't even know if there really was a Jesus. That's out there. My friends, there's over 24,000 copies of manuscripts written within 25 years of the events. The next closest work of antiquity is Homer's Iliad with 643 copies and the closest original is 500 copies. The closest copy is 500 years after the original was written. There is no other ancient work that is so verifiably true and accurate as to what is written than the New Testament. Now, I'm omitting a lot of stuff for the sake of trying, getting things done in one service. Well, you know, we really can't trust and we don't really know if what was said is true. How many of you, and I will throw this as far as in the Old Testament, how many of you all have heard of the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. Okay. Well, what made the Dead Sea Scrolls so incredibly awesome and amazing is they found a copy of, the, of a, a, a parchment of a scroll of the book of Isaiah and they just, in one chapter, one chapter, they compared it to the, a thousand years earlier. I think it was one of the chapters, like in, uh, 50, I think it's Isaiah 53. When they all said and done, after a thousand years, there was only one word that could be argued as different. One. Now, we're not going to go into how they did it because that's not where I want to go because I'm assuming you're all going to research this stuff. Well, you know, those guys, those Old Testament people, they just didn't know what they were doing. Listen, after a thousand years, that's why in history, when you hear about the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was such a humongous discovery because they found that even after a thousand years. And then it's only arguably one word. Let's keep going. In the Old Testament, there are over 300 references to Jesus' coming. The odds of just 48 of those prophecies coming to pass in one person is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Do the math. In other words, put a 10, 1 in 10, put 157 zeros after it. And that's the odds of just 48 of them coming to pass, let alone over 300 direct prophecies. And see, listen, if the Word of God is just that, the Word of God, then what it said was going to happen in the future should have happened. Listen, I'll just throw out a couple right now. Does G I would say Jesus has the right to say what he wants to say. First of all, he said, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to die. I'm going to tell you how many days I'm going to be dead. I'm going to tell you when I'm coming back. And by the way, I'm going to tell you, when all this is said and done, you see all this temple all around you, it's all going away. It's not even a stone is going to be left. In other words, he could, because he's outside of time, he was injected into it, but he exists outside of it. Time to him, he's here. It's a timeline. It's a line in front of him, and he can go to any place. That's why he's I am. 
Like, because he's outside of a unit of measurement in this creation called time, he's outside of it. And he can go over here and be just as present there as he's present over there. And he can just pay... <coughs> all, he needed, all he did was, he's here, okay? And he's looking at the part here where he's going to be crucified. He just goes over here. Oh, by the way, you see this temple? It's all going to get toast. Oh, by the way, you want to know, that's why it's easy to tell us what's going to happen at the end of the age, because he's outside of time. He's just looking at that unit of measurement outside of him. He's like, all right, that's what it's going to look like when it wraps things up. He knows. Well, you know, we don't really know that there's a Jesus. I just listed a few. These are secular writers that talked about the life of Jesus. Christians, how they served God. Ancient secular writers, Cornelius Tacitus, Lucian, Flavius Josephus, Suetonius, Phlegon. There's more of them. But you ever hear your professor years like, well, because that's out there, and it just you just want to choke some people sometimes because it's just so ridiculous the things people come up with and they have no clue what they're talking about. How did we get the scriptures? Well, who gave anybody the right to decide what was going to be the Word of God or not? That's not what happened. In 393 AD, there was no authority conferred. In other words, when they showed up with the books of the New Testament and they finally decided it, they didn't vote to see what was right and then go, oh, this would be really good to have in there. They only recognized what was already being used. The process was so heated, rigorous, and thorough that there are some books that almost didn't even make it in. They were that surgical to confirm genuine apostolic usage and authority. In other words, what they had and when they presented it together, listen, divinity, man doesn't decide what's divine, he just recognized it. Amen. Well, you know, there's all those contradictions. Contradictions aren't contradictions at all once language differences are understood and different perspectives from individual audience members. My daughter was asking me a question about uh, why does one gospel say this and the other one say that. All right, I'm going to make two statements. I saw Dennis at church today. I had a great time in church with all my friends. Are both the truth? Are either of them a contradiction? Thank God that the Word of God gives us multiple perspectives. And the reason why the Lord does it, see, you stop tripping up when you recognize, oh my. What he's trying to do is he's trying to paint from many different angles. As a pilot, how many of you all know Mount Monadnock looks a whole lot different from 40,000 feet than it does when you're driving your car up it? These are not contradictions. They're gifts to us from different writers on this is what we experienced. And when you put them all together, you go, oh, it makes total sense now. The authority. What authority? And see, this is where now, what's, this, what's the term? The rubber meets the road. Because if we have evidences that Jesus is who he says he is, if we have evidences that the scriptures are what was said, what was written, that they are what they say there are, then the next logical step and where we're going to, we have to talk. We have to. We have to talk about the authority it has to tell you how you're going to live. How you're going to worship God. Under whose name you'll worship God. What he likes and what he doesn't like. Now, one thing I'll clear up before we get going any, any further, and I used, this, uh, I used this illustration the other day. How many of you all have children? Anybody have children? Okay, great. Okay. If those of you who have children, do you love your children unconditionally? But the next question is, does your unconditional love give them permission for unconditional behavior? Better let that sit in now. 
Because even people in the pulpit now are confusing God's unconditional love and they're equating that to God's unconditional permission. You live however the heck you want. So if there's evidences for Jesus, his right to say what he says, the evidences, and again, this is the surface. This is a, this is a whole course. This is a life's time study. I'm just giving you the equipment. We're just hitting 40 minutes. So he said not to take, you know, I'm taking my time. We're not going to be that much longer. But even if we are, I don't care. Because <laughs> I want you to have access to material that you can go to. So if those things are true, then that gives the Word of God the authority to say what it's going to say. Watch this. Luke 16, 30. And this is, a, you remember the rich man, Lazarus? This guy was rich. He, the Lazarus was sat outside his house. He didn't take, use his money to help the guy. Matter of fact, Lazarus was sick, beat up. He didn't have any, hardly anything to eat. The rich man just completely ignored him. And, well, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about hell. The Bible talks about hell more than it talks about heaven, especially in the Gospels. There is a hell, because if this stuff is true, then hell is as real as heaven. And I would also submit to you, if hell's not real, God is not just. Because I can think of some real awful people that have done some awful things, and if they don't have anything coming to them, why do you even want to live right? And so he's finishing up. And so the, what the, the son, who was in torment, what this guy said, he said, look... I got, bro I got brothers that are doing the same stupid things that I am. Can you send him? <laughs> so he says, why don't you send Lazarus back? So send him, just send, the guy, send, uh, send him back from the dead. They'll believe a supernatural experience. They'll believe spiritism. Ooh, there's evil in my house. Ooh, I'm seeing white ghosts. I'll tell you what ghosts are. They're demons. That's all they are. The scriptures are clear. It is appointed once unto man to die and then the judgment. He does not come back to the earth. The only other spirits on the earth outside of humans are demons. That's it. Watch this, but watch what he says. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. God's word is superior to supernatural experiences. You don't need a ghost. You don't need a seance. You don't need your father to come and visit you. You have the word of God where your father in heaven forever has spoken to you. And you'll get more wisdom in 10 seconds from the word of God than you will some ghost in the next 50 years. That's right. How am I doing so far, Pastor Dennis? God's word is superior to supernatural experiences. This is Jesus talking. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe in his writings, how will you believe? Even Jesus appealed to the scriptures and the word of God for his authority. Jesus appealed to the word over supernatural experiences. He even appealed to the word over the things that he was doing. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, watch, as it really is the word of God. 2 Peter 3.16, our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable, we're going to come back to that, twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. These men knew they were speaking the word of God. They were not phobic. It has nothing to do with culture. It is God outside of time speaking to these people saying, this is the way it is. The New Testament writers were clear that what they wrote was the word of God, not traditions or opinions based on phobia.
Nowhere, watch this, here we go. And I want you to think about this because this, this is one of the latest ones because now I'm going to really start getting into it. I'm deeper in the rabbit hole. And you'll find out how serious this is in a second. <clears throat> We're going to finish up talking about what God thinks about people changing his word. We're going to talk about what he thinks about those kinds of people. That includes your professor. That includes your politician, your news commentator. We're going to find out just what he thinks. This is how serious he takes this. Nowhere did Jesus refute the Old Testament as being old-fashioned, judgmental, not culturally relevant. And frankly, not only did he not loosen the standards, he tightened them. Well, you've heard it say, thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> Crank it up a bit. You can't even look at someone and have lust after them. And you're busted. And you'd swear, listening to a lot of what's out there on the airwaves today, is that Jesus came and died so that the, there is no more standards. He died. You hear a lot, some of these people going off, and it's like, well, he died so you could just go be whoever you want and do whatever you want. No, he cranked it up. Why? Because there's more power available to the church than ever was available to an Old Testament saint. So the standards are higher. I wrote this the other day, too. I said, how many of y'all get my word of the day in the email? Yeah. See, here's my question. You need a savior because you're involved in things or doing things that you need to be saved from. If you just keep going down the list and taking them all out, why would you even need a savior? Think about it. I want you to remember this. Next time your philosophy pro uh, professor wants to eloqu wax eloquently, I want you to remember Jim Carrey. <laughs> Next time someone in high school wants to tell you that this whole Jesus thing, that you're just crazy about it, ignorant and unstable, in other words, those who have no clue what they were talking about, pay no attention. For the sake of time, I'm just, it's in 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm talking to even ministers right now. Just before I read this, I'm talking to ministers. Let me give you a piece of advice. Do what I do regularly. Find somebody else. I have regularly asked the Lord to find somebody else. Did you know just this week I was given an offer? Just this week I was given an offer to go launch a launch, and I could do both again, to go launch a, launch, a fly a billionaire around the world. I was personally called. Package and everything would start me just under 200000 a year, first year. And I'd continue my duties here, and trust me, I get paid more than 20000 So you start doing the math, the numbers, that were made available to me. And if you don't think for one second, now it's not a temptation. I'm going to say no. I, he, I have till Monday. Pastor, minister, those of you who want to go in the ministry, before you even start, and listen, I got a scriptural basis for this. James, the apostle James said this. He says, don't let many of you want to do this job because it's going to be so more severely judged. You do not want this. I have regularly said, find somebody else. Let me go hang out in Nice. In England. Scotland. In the Caribbean. In Aspen. Let me bring my golf clubs and be gone a week at a time while you guys are worrying about ice on your driveway. I'm worrying about birdieing the 18th to shoot even par. <laughs> the whole time I'm on the clock. Don't think for a second I haven't given my life and sacrificed a lot to stand here and talk to you like I'm talking to you today. I've earned the right to be in your face because of what I've given up for this. Preacher, 
minister. We need to listen carefully to what he thinks about ministers coming and taking the word of God and throwing things down. That means what the Apostle Paul, that means what Peter said, <clears throat> that means what these guys said about lying, adultery, stealing, tax evasion, homosexuality, transgenderism. That means you have got to consider. I'm not telling you what to do. I've not one time in this entire service said to you anything about what you need to do. I'm giving you information so you can make an intelligent decision. You live however you want. And there are people that have tested me. I have, in, in a good way, I'm not using this bad, I can get along with anybody. I don't care what your ism is. Because it's between you and God. I'm only giving you the information if you want to have that while you say you want to serve God, you better think awfully long and hard because he was very clear with what he said. I have close friends that are homosexuals. I'm fine, I don't judge them. I don't let's not confuse not judging with agreeing. And I love that. I will hold their hand even on their deathbed. But I cannot change. If they ask, what does God think? Then this is what he thinks. I didn't say it. And Mr. Politician or Mr. Mob and picket scientist that one day I know is going to picket person is going to come and say, I will not be like Jeff Flake. I won't bend in front of you. I didn't write this. And I'm not going to allow you to impose your labels on me that do not exist. They're not real. I'm giving my life to the service of people in the darkest of the dark. But if you ask, if you say you want to serve God and you want to look at the evidences and you need to look at this, we've already talked about the authority and the right it has to tell you how you're going to live. And I'll put this one out there. I want to know how someone gets to pick and choose. Why do I have to give my life suffering to say no to sin, but you get to go and do whatever you want? You want to tell me how that worked? Now, we don't have time to go into it this week. By the way, <clears throat> can I tell you something about all the stuff that's going on? It can be homosexuality, transgender, stuff like that. We're going to go into I might go into it next week. You got, Christians, you got to stop freaking out about people dealing with stuff in their flesh. There's nothing new. Why would you have a hard time loving someone who's working things out? If someone's having issues and they've got things in their head, then why do you want to kill them? Hold their hand. Walk it through them. And if they make a decision they want to stay, great. They'll stand before the Lord one day, but why would you hate them? Why would you get uncomfortable around them? Matter of fact, I have more fun with people that are in some really bad situations. And parents, you know, your, your teenager, your kid brings over someone like that. Would you stop freaking out? Do you know Jesus is there? The darkest things you ever find on the Internet, do you know Jesus is right there in the middle of seeing all that too? I kind of figure if he's not blown away by the things people are working through, we start talking about Corinth. Our nation has nothing based, uh, compared to the darkness Corinth walked in. And Paul had a church right in the middle of it. And these guys were still doing things. Why do you think he told them not to, do, uh, to stay away from idolatry? Why do you think he told them not to join themselves to a prostitute? I'll tell you why. Because there were a thousand prostitutes in the temple of Aphrodite. And they thought they could continually worship while they're having sex with a hooker. He didn't tell them they were going to hell. He's like, you guys, you can't live like this anymore. Oh, no more sex with a hooker. <laughs> and then he gave the reason why. And that happens a lot, doesn't it? I know I'm going off just here a little bit before I finish. Remember I told you I wasn't in a hurry. This is that important. Are you, can you guys see how important this message is? Can we stop freaking out when someone stands up and says, you know what, I think I'm this? Why do we get uncomfortable about people that we're supposed to love? Why? But we established earlier, love, unconditional love is not unconditional permission. And frankly, if someone's dealing with some things, they probably need an arm around them rather than a scripture verse. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, you know what? How about we, you don't have to talk to them about what you're going through. Let's go out to dinner. 
Because I'm not here to beat the daylights out of you. I'm here if you have questions. Let me hold your hand and I can help you. And if you want to, and if this is how you want to live your life, I'm still going to love you. I can't go to certain places with you. But as much as you demand, and certain people groups are certainly in our face demanding that we acknowledge them, even approve, I just want the same favor. If you don't want to go there with me, then don't make me want to get, don't try, and then especially don't try to legislate to make me go with you. That's wrong. Let's finish. Just hit an hour. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Listen to what happens to people who decide they're going to take the word. Now listen. If they're going to say this about the word of God, you might want to not mess with it at all. But there were also false, false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly, that's what Jude had been dealing with, bring in destructive heresies. Getting to the point where they'll even deny the Lord who bought them. And watch what happens though. And this will bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways because of the, whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Watch. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. The common thread whenever he deals with these false teachers, the main fruit on the tree of what they're teaching is when they start pulling away standards of the Word of God and saying, you can live however you want. God thinks it's just great that you sleep with these people. He's okay with you being like this. You can cut and slice and dice, and I'm not being smart. I'm just telling you, there's teachers that say they twist and they turn this thing. It says what it says. And if you're going to take the job position doing this, then you need to serve your boss right. and you do what the boss says yes. or get another job right. Right. That's right. for if now listen for if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bring in the blood of the deadly world. I'll just stop there because we can go to Jude. Paul talks about it too. In other words, God equates false teachers and those that change his word. He equates them on the same level as demons that are chained in hell and the future is the same. better find another job you can't do this if you can't do this pastor then find another job I have begged for another job because if there's any job that can be is so misunderstood here is that Jesus God himself came to bring salvation and they drilled him with nails You ever see the movie The Matrix? And I'm going to close with that testimony from that atheist I was talking about. All right, do you remember what they, those squiggly things, those machines that came when the ship was there in the cave and squigglies come? <clears throat> and what they do is they're constantly in, uh, in underneath the ground, you know, where the uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar was, the ship and everything like that. And the moment there was a sign that humans were there, they instantly reacted and swarmed. Make no mistake, the kingdom of darkness works the same way. They act, demons act like antibodies, and they do not want anything invading this earth. And it's so bad that when Jesus was crucified, the entire kingdom of darkness swarmed on him like those squigglies. Make no mistake, every preacher, you guys, see, you can't be surprised. If you stand for what's right, squigglies are going to come around. But listen, the name of Jesus is the same thing as hitting that button, and they all have to bend. I'll leave with this. You guys know who that is? Man's name is C.S. Lewis. And like I said, I, I didn't want to screw this up, so I, I wanted to just read it. The literary, the literary scholar, C.S. Lewis, former professor of medieval and renaissance literature at Cambridge University, 
when writing about his conversion to Christianity, indicated that he had believed Christians to be wrong. The last thing Lewis wanted was to embrace Christianity. However, and here's his story, early in 1926, the hardest boiled of all atheists I ever knew sat in my room on the other side of the fire and remarked that the evidence for the histori historicity of the Gospels was really surprisingly good. It's an, ancient, it's an old uh, English term, rum thing, he said, and went on. All that stuff of Frazier, who was a philosopher at the time, about uh, all that stuff about the dying God, it's ridiculous. It almost looks as if it really happened. C.S. Lewis says, to understand the shattering impact of what he just said, you would need to know this man, who has certainly never since shown, ever since shown any interest in Christianity, if he, the cynic of cynics, the toughest of the tough, were not, as I would still have put it, still have put it safe, if he wasn't safe, where could I possibly turn? Was there then no escape? And after evaluating the basis and evidence for Christianity, Lewis concluded that in other religions there is no such historical claim as in Christianity. No other religion can claim and has the evidences that Christ... Because, and remember, you'll hear it here regularly, this is all founded on a resurrection. The evidence of a Savior that was dead verified dead by experts in death and he got up just as he said he would and he was seen by even if we take just one group you'd have to sit for 50 hours and listen to their testimony after evaluating the basis and evidence for Christianity Lewis concluded that in other religions there was no such historical claim as in Christianity and his knowledge of literature forced him to treat the gospel record as a trustworthy account. Lewis says, I was by now too experienced in literary criticism to regard the gospels as a myth. You tell your philosophy professor. Got his first job in high school working at 40000 a year or whatever it is. By the way, teachers should get paid more. Finally, contrary to his strong stand against Christianity, Professor Lewis had to make, and this is key, nothing I said here today is appealing to some supernatural event, some ghost, some feeling. Notice what it is that brought him to his, and caused him to be one of the greatest Christian defenders, apologists that ever lived. Finally, contrary to his strong stand against Christianity, Professor Lewis had to make an intelligent decision. Intelligent. Well, Christianity, faith doesn't involve intelligence. You're full of garbage. Genuine faith is based on intelligent fact and knowledge. And here's what he said. Last paragraph. You must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen. Night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. And that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the year of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England could come to know God Christianity is all about your intelligence or founded on it's not emotions it'll produce it passion it'll produce it Jack Webb used to say, the facts, man. Just the facts. And as we're getting ready to pray, if you're on the fence, you thought you were so smart, 
if your conclusion is this stuff isn't real, I challenge you. Oh, and by the way, using the illustration again, if you've got things you're not sure of, why don't you come and talk to me? Someone knows what they're talking about. Your friends are probably just as confused as you are. It is unfair to you, your eternal destiny, your own sense of reality and sanity. It is wrong to think that you're off the hook because you went to talk to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. And then to settle it as and then to leave as settled fact. My toilet's clogged. I don't ask my electrician how to unclog the toilet. I go to a plumber. Your theology should be explored, sought out, discussed, even argued with someone that can keep up with you. And actually, I'd submit, I haven't run into anybody yet that I can't keep up with, Harvard and MIT included. Doesn't mean they totally agree with me, but I can keep up. And I will have an answer for you. Intelligent, fact-based. I believe my, uh, what God wanted for me today was to give you enough information. All right, and guess what? Hey, did anybody, pass, did anybody die in our service? No. So I guess literally I can say you lived. Amen. He was very clear, do not be in a hurry on this one. And this is going to be up on the internet. Let me ask you a couple questions because if newspapers were watching, and you might have, oh, and by the way, did you know that especially the younger you are and the more you're brought up in this generation, you know that you are constantly being trained to not, not only not listen to everything I'm saying, but you already are trained to have five or six labels to put on me to stop you from listening? Those are called squigglies that have gotten your head through Instagram and Facebook versus facts. There are antibodies on the earth that are so effective. Now, God had it all planned out and go, okay, squeaky, go ahead and nail him to the cross. I'm not going to tell you, but that's exactly what needs to happen. And that's what brought him to his knees and destroyed the devil's kingdom. And so when you decide to make a stand, I'm just telling you, no, squigglies are already there, ready. And I just equipped you, just, it, just in one service, you have enough information and facts To not be intimidated in any way. You don't let anybody get in your face and point their finger at them. And you talk to them, but they're going to treat you with respect. Jesus, did you know Jesus could get snarky? You go through. He didn't tolerate with everything all the time. He didn't let you be a wise mouth to him. Especially if you were a Pharisee or religion trying to trap him. He blasted them. This, this whole head bowed low, bobble headed thing on the, on the dashboard Jesus. You better get rid of that. Church needs to be showing some fire. I think it's also something to be said. All these guys, Paul, Peter, 11 of the 12, and all the way to this generation, isn't it something that there must be something so true to this thing? You couldn't, no matter how hard you beat them, they couldn't deny it. They could not deny what they saw, who they saw. There's a principle called do not cast your pearls before swine. He wasn't calling people pigs. What he's saying is don't talk to people who don't have an ear to hear it. Just don't waste your time. Can I also make a suggestion? If you're in a situation that you don't know the answers, if you're not sure, please don't continue to look so stupid. You give them a license to think we're stupid. Just walk away and say, you know what, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'm more than willing to introduce you to someone who does. Take the pressure off you because they're going to back you into a corner and they're going to say, are you telling me? Don't ever let anybody tell you, tell you you're telling them anything. No, you're not. You're reporting. Yes. I'm an eyewitness. I'm a reporter. I'm not an enforcer. I only report, usually when asked. Don't take this pressure, man. They're there to intimidate you. I can't wait for those first reporters to come and get us. 
We've already got worked out how we're going to do it. Be gracious, by the way. But if you think for one second that my I'm bending for you as a son of the Most High God, if you think for one second you're going to push me into some corner, I'm not going to tell you what. I've already got it ready. No. Not just my answers, but how we're going to answer. With who we're going to answer. You generally, you want to interview me? You got it. But here's my stipulations. But you're not going to see me fumble over my words either. Anybody think I'm a hater? No, because I didn't say anything. I just reported. Do you think I'm judgmental because God says you're going to live right? Or did he just say it? You can't live with whoever you want. You can't sleep with whoever you want. You, can, you just can't. And you know that the number one reason uh, next the millennials are leaving the church is because they believe the church isn't telling them the truth. At least I gave you some facts to think about. I don't ever have to see you again. And part of me doesn't care. Part of me does. But I gave you the information. So you got something to think about. There's a bunch of things you can accuse me of, but one of them is holding back is not one of them. And you know what? Believing this stuff has given me a really good life. It's been up and down a lot, and we've been through some bad times. But this Jesus stuff is real. And I cannot deny the principles that have allowed me to be so blessed that saved me when I was so cursed. Can anyone leave this service or watch this today and go, Pastor Joe hates gay people. Pastor Joe was judging gender dysphoria. No, Pastor Joe was saying, hey, pay, let's pay attention to this. Pastor Joe also said, Christians, you better back off if you're trying to kill people with this stuff because they probably need a hug more than they need your scripture verse. Gosh, we gotta fall. love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say love your neighbor as yourself unless they're gay, or unless or whatever flavor of sin you want to pick. Thank God for a savior. We can love people. That's the third time I've said that this morning. Because again, I already know Squiggly trained you, especially this generation, to say to leave here going, he hates me. Things have tried to get in your head. He doesn't understand me. You want to bet? I've had things happen to me when I was a kid. And I know what it's like. And you're not going to tell me you get up while you're dealing with these things feeling all great and awesome and you're so liberated. No, you feel shame. You feel disgust because of something happened to you or something that you feel. And that's not environmental pressure. That's deep down inside that you know something's wrong. And you can get any politician you want to try to defend and legislate that. You cannot change that when no one else is around. In here, there's a reason why you do struggle because it isn't natural to have those things. No matter how much TV tries to tell you it is. You know in here. You don't need a scripture verse. You don't need your parent. You have in here, there's a con conflict on the inside of you and the reason there's a conflict is because for some reason it's not fitting. Anybody have anything to say? <laughs> you feel me? Man, he, he loves us. He loves us. And he told us the truth. But here's the thing. And now, okay, we're, we've done, I'll get up here because we are done. I'm going to pray. If he takes so serious what he has to say about how you're going to live, don't you think he takes as serious what he promises he'll do for you if you just believe it? See, if the word of God is true there, then if the word of God is true, surely he's borne my sickness and carried my pains. Surely with blessing he will bless me. 
and he'll multiply me. And I'll leave with this. Satan does the same thing always. When he came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, did God really say? And this is where I'll leave you with this as we pray. The judgment on Adam and Eve for agreeing to twist the Word of God was swift and instant. And pastor, you better ask yourself, preacher, what makes us think he won't be as swift if we think we can do the same thing? Listening to the serpent saying, did God really say? He must take his word pretty serious if he equals false teachers and manipulators with chained up demons. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh, we worship your holy name. We glorify you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that the foundation for our faith is sure. Father, I thank you. You just loved us. You don't, you're not blaming any of us for what we get caught into. What you do is you inform us what you think so that should we desire, we can follow after you and find your grace there to meet us. You're so good. Adam and Eve fell, and the kingdom of darkness, it fl he flooded the earth with such confusion and perversion. It didn't take but a few generations where, Father, even by your judgment, you went, there's nobody that's doing it right. i got to wipe this whole mess out, except for you found one family. Father, I thank you. You are outside of our time. You look into it, and you inject into it. And that's awesome because that means outside of the me unit of measurement called time, you're outside. That means you, when you said what you said, you're already warning what you see 200, 300, 400 years later, whenever you're going to come back. This is incredible to have writings that in detail tell us our future. They tell us what's available to us. They warn us about, hey, danger, Will Robinson, danger. Thank you so much that you're not like those who have believed the lie that you're separate from us, that you leave us alone to our own devices, that you're not involved in our creation. What a terrible lie that is for someone to believe that you create and then totally pulled back and not involved. You couldn't have called yourself a father if that was the case. If the number of our, uh, the hairs on our head are numbered, that means you are intimate acquainted with our creation. If you're in this room and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, you don't know what, he is to, what it is to have a Savior. Matter of fact, maybe you got hit with some things and you went, oh, I'm in trouble. I need the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus to come in. I need to be washed. I need to learn what it is to live a holy life, a separated life unto Him. My gosh, my friends, look up for two seconds. Let me tell you how great it is to live a clean life. How inst instantly when things are, Jesus, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Whoop! You know what I'll do sometimes in a car wash, just to do it, and the water's hitting it, just hit the windshield wipers. Just to, whoosh. You know how quick that's a, that cleans that windshield up? The blood of Jesus yes. cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Okay, Beep. eyes down. If you're in here and you've never met Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. If you're watching, if you lasted the hour and ten minutes through this, you're still here and you need to meet Jesus. Now's the time. By the way, you do. Anybody in here need to come to Christ? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Let's look up. God didn't call us to live in caves and hide in our own little group and judge the rest of the world. He said, go. 
you're involved in any kind of group that wants to hide you. you got some kind of fear. You want to stay away from the world. Tribulation, shelters, packages. You're, you ain't reading the Bible. Well, God wants us holy and clean, really. Does anybody get cleaner than Jesus? He came into a filthy, disgusting world and gave his life for it. You think you're, you're not showing me you're spiritual unless you can go into the deepest darkness and help them. Hanging out in rapture huts is stupid. Our group is so special. No, you're so deceived. Jesus. Amen. Amen. You got me today, right? Even when I got on the whole wake up. I'll go a little bit shorter next week. I took some extra time today.